of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. 
But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, 
I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. synagogue at Nazareth, Jesus read from the book of the prophet Isaiah and began to say, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What is Jesus talking about in today's Gospel? Why is everyone getting so angry? What are these Nazarenes so upset about? In order to get the whole picture of what Jesus is proclaiming in this week's Gospel, we need to remember the whole story, which began in last week's Gospel. Not only that, but we need to remember where this story falls in the larger Gospel narrative of Luke. 
This is the first act of Jesus' public ministry following his baptism and temptation in the desert. This proclamation in the Nazareth synagogue, this reading and referencing of scripture, this whole episode is Jesus' thesis statement that sets the stage for his whole ministry. It lays the ideological foundation for everything he will teach about the kingdom of God and every action he will take along his way. In the first half of this story that we heard in last week's gospel, Jesus stood in the synagogue and read from the scroll of Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These are amazing words, made only more powerful by the words he does not read from this passage in Isaiah 61. See, the last verse is supposed to read like this, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. But Jesus leaves the second part out, rolls up the scroll, and sits down. He does not proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. He proclaims the year of the Lord's favor and then goes on to say that these scriptures are being fulfilled. Not the day of vengeance, but the year of favor. These Nazarenes are aware of their cultural history. They know what is supposed to come after the year of the Lord's favor in Isaiah. It is the day of vengeance for all those who have harmed them, They are able to hold together their identity and hope with the knowledge that there are groups out there who will feel the vengeance of God, who are not chosen like them, who are not privileged in the eyes of God as they are. Their entire construction of God's salvation and work in the world is one where if one group prospers, another must suffer. If one group survives, it must be at the expense of another. If one group receives favor, another must receive vengeance. But Jesus leaves these words out. And so the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he says to those assembled, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. They recognize these words as gracious and are amazed at his teaching. But they still can't fully buy in because they can't believe that one of their own could possibly know what Jesus knows or be able to speak the truth of what Jesus is speaking. A dynamic that is only brought to even starker contrast when Jesus responds with his words in today's gospel. Jesus continues by citing two stories from Hebrew scripture, one about the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings and another about the prophet Elisha in 2 Kings. He mentions these stories in reference to their questioning of his teachings. But unlike other parallels of this story in Mark and Matthew, there is nothing here about Jesus being unable to perform miracles because of the unbelief of those present. Instead, Jesus is using these scriptures to continue his teaching on the year of the Lord's favor that he began in last week's Gospel. The stories Jesus references are not about a prophet's inability to do the work of God within their home communities. They are about God intentionally calling those prophets out beyond that community to do work outside of their group, outside of Israel. Jesus is using these stories to tell the people there that there is healing and freedom being offered beyond the boundaries of their Galilean Jewish community. Their revelry at his gracious words turns quickly to rage as they realize the ramifications of his teaching. Their discomfort is brought to unbearable levels as Jesus tells them that their zero-sum economy of salvation is not the economy of the kingdom of God. This is a truth that they cannot handle. 
Their entire structure of hope and comfort had been built on the idea, now being shown to be an illusion, that favor for one must mean vengeance for another. But Jesus, in reminding them of their own history, quickly shows the truth of this false belief. Jesus knows that this gospel, this kingdom of God, is bigger than one group, than one religion, than one race, than one class. He knows that the Hebrew scriptures are Israel's history and that they hold the truth of the present and future as well as the past. This month, we celebrate black history in an attempt to highlight the people and voices that have been for too long oppressed and silenced in our country. We also are reminded of how far we have to go for there to be equality in our country. Too often, we highlight the parts of our history that make us comfortable and look past those parts that don't. But as Jesus calls out to the Nazarenes that the kingdom of God is something more than their zero-sum economy, he calls out to us as well. As we enter into this month of celebrating black history and becoming aware of the work we still have to do in our country and our church, Jesus is calling out from these pages for us to wake up and to realize that this zero-sum economy is not a thing of the past. This zero-sum society is not relegated to the Israelites of Elijah and Elisha or the Nazarenes with Jesus. In this Black History Month, and for all the months that follow, we must recognize how this zero-sum economy still pervades today. Not only that, but when we look at those parts of history that we would rather not, we must recognize that it is the foundation on which the entire country was built. As a privileged person, and as a white privileged person, of which there are many in this room, Jesus is calling to me to stop pretending like we have figured it all out. He is calling to us to stop pretending that racism is a thing of the past, and recognize that we have more work to do. In this gospel and in this Black History Month, Jesus is calling out to those of us who recognize ourselves as white and privileged to stop putting the burden of race on the shoulders of persons of color, as it has so often in the past. This, of course, is a massive and overwhelming undertaking. It comes with much discomfort and uncertainty. But as Jesus is telling, telling these Nazarenes in today's gospel, the kingdom of God cannot exist in any other way. In a March 2018 interview, journalist and best-selling author ta Coates was asked, what would incentivize the privileged to understand and actively work to reverse the injustices that not only built America, but still plague America to date. He responded, the belief that it was so central to their interest that it just had to get done. In a follow-up to this answer, he was asked even more directly, what is the price that white America has to pay? in order to actually change these underlying structures? His answer? A complete loss of whiteness and its suite of privileges. When pressed for more detail, he began by referencing the seemingly static 20 to 1 wealth gap in the United States. For every nickel that black people have, white people have a dollar. It would require a loss of wealth, a massive redistribution of wealth. We would have to live together. Trayvon Martin would have to be more than just an abstraction to you. The way you define yourself of having some sort of place on the societal ladder is that there is some sort of bottom to which you could not sink. The promise of whiteness in America 
is that no matter what happens, you will never be black. What ta Coates is suggesting is a radical reorienting of our economic and cultural structures that begins with a recognition of how those systems which are in place today were built, how they are actively working to oppress persons of color, and then recognizing as a privileged white person that it is in my interest to dismantle and radically change these structures. But this task is near impossible in the face of current societal models because it would require those of us in the privileged white spaces of America to actively work against our own comfort and security, to invest in the comfort and security of persons of color. We have created a zero-sum economy in a zero-sum society, where the comfort of one person, socially and economically, is tied directly to the discomfort of another. This is capitalism. This is racism. This is the system with wi within which we live and move. My comfort as a white person is at the expense of the discomfort of a person of color. This is how our country was built. This is the truth we need to be able to look in the face for anything to ever change. This is what those Nazarenes wanted to throw Jesus off of a cliff for pointing out. They were operating under the false belief that God's salvation was a zero-sum game, as was their own prosperity and well-being as a people. Jesus, in proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, left out the zero-sum game of the day of vengeance of our God. Not only that, but he showed them that God had moved in their history to bring salvation, prosperity, and healing to those beyond what they believed to be their privileged group. Jesus was at the beginning of his ministry and was only just getting started. Jesus knew the truth that the kingdom of God is not a zero-sum game and that the economy of the kingdom of heaven is not one either. And this truth cannot be silenced, no matter how big the crowd of silencers or how high the cliff off of which they hope to cast it. The kingdom of God is at hand, and we act against our own self-interest and the interest of all people the more we take part in these social and cultural systems of oppression. The kingdom of God is not something we wait for, the kingdom of God is something that we have to actually work to bring about, and we are not there. Just as racism has to be actively dismantled, the kingdom of God needs to be actively built. And these two go hand in hand. As long as we are participating in zero-sum systems that are built on and still feature oppression of certain people, we are living removed from the kingdom of God. Participation is not passive, it is active. It requires something of us. We will not be there until the mountains have been made low and the valleys have been filled up and the way is made level for all people. We will not be there until we can get beyond the privileged comforts of colorblindness and token offerings and undertake a radical redistribution of wealth and comfort. We will not be there until the church we attend looks like the world within which it exists. Black History Month is vastly important, but we cannot take it as a sign that we have arrived. There are too many people of color living in fear, too many neighborhoods segregated, and too many persons of color incarcerated to believe that we have arrived anywhere but where we started. Racism is not something that will just go away with time. We have to do something about it. We can't just pretend to be post-racial. We have to be actively anti-racist. We have to be radically invested in the well-being of all people, educate ourselves, and become aware of the ways in which we participate in white supremacist systems. 
like those angry Nazarenes in the gospel, we have to recognize that our own comfort comes at the cost of someone else's, that our own wealth comes at the cost of someone else's. We have to recognize that we lose something when all the spaces we inhabit look like us. Racism is sophisticated. It is smart. It is adaptable. It does not go away. It evolves. It stops looking like slavery and starts looking like Jim Crow laws. It stops looking like Jim Crow and starts looking like redlining and mass incarceration. When we are comfortable, the privileged, we can't help but become defensive and enraged when our own comfort and privilege are challenged and questioned, when our zero-sum economies are challenged. But this is the gospel. This is the kingdom of God. This is the good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. And it is those of us who are privileged that are the blind ones. But there is another option. We can have our eyes opened to recognize that like Jesus moved on that cliff, the truth will move among us, through us, and in the midst of our anger, defensiveness, fear, and turmoil. Not only that, but this truth will continue on its way like Jesus, whether we decide to follow or not. The question for the privileged, for those benefiting from the zero-sum economy, is whether or not we will follow Jesus as he works toward the kingdom of heaven. Work to look our races past and present in the face, and work to actively dismantle the oppressive systems that exist both in the country and in the church. What is your work to do? Where will you go from here?
Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. And we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. And your name be glorified by all. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Catherine, our assisting bishop, Penny, our dean, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who sleep outside and all who suffer from any grief or trouble. Delivered from their distress. Give to, to the departed eternal rest. We pray for Paul Tedford, Josephina Vargas, Mark Asher, John Greer, Toby Leflang, and for those we now name. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for James McLeod, Melinda Osley, Stacy Sullivan, Jim Cunning, Fran Young, David Gibbs, Kay Potter, Gary Tollick, Julie Hyssop, Christy Fleming, Carmen Bates, Pat Tedford and family, Florence T. Bustamante, the Leflang and Bassler families, William and Krista Murray, Marie Esther de la Torre, Harvey and Gail DeVore and family, Beth Beal, Nathan, and Alexandra Bird, Vivian Close, Tacey Cook, Mari Bickford, Ellie Asher and family, Wayne Blizzard, and those we now name. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially for the birth of Sersha Victor Victoria McClure Smith, granddaughter of Mark and Susan McClure, and Sarah and Amit Singh's baby boy. We give thanks for the election of Susan Brown Snook as the fifth bishop of San Diego. Almighty God, who created us in your own image, grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression, and that we may reverently use our freedom, help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations, to the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. God, Lord, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our own heart. We have not loved our neighbors. <laughs> We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may derive from the will of the Lord, and will of the glory of your name. Have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And 
also with me. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Penny Bridges. I serve as the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, and it's my joy to welcome you this morning, whoever you are and wherever you find yourself in the journey of faith. Please know that you are most welcome to participate in all that we do here. God's table is open to everyone, and at communion time, when you come forward, if you wish to receive the sacrament, put your hands together, one on top of the other. If you prefer to receive a blessing, cross your hands at your shoulders, and if you require a gluten-free wafer, they will be available over on this side by the Guadalupe station. A special welcome to you if you're visiting with us today. I hope that you'll stop by our welcome table outside in the courtyard after the service and introduce yourself and tell us a little about yourself. If you're celebrating a birthday or an anniversary this week, I invite you to stand as I say a prayer for you. Over there and there. Anyone behind? There. Let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts, may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Many happy returns to you all. Um, I draw your attention to our Cathedral Life leaflet, which is behind the music and the hymns in your cream booklet. Um, there are details of all kinds of things going on, um, including our forums. Um, this is Black History Month, as David said in his sermon. Um, I'll be blessing the artwork at the end of the service, and many thanks to Rick Todd for putting together the exhibit for us and the forums. It was a lovely storytelling forum this morning. I'm looking forward to the rest of the month. Um, you heard us say, uh, give thanks in the prayers uh, for the election of the Reverend Canon Susan Brown Snook as our next bishop. It was an exciting morning at St. Bart's yesterday. Uh, we elected her on one ballot, which is pretty unusual and very decisive. Um, we'll be sharing our experience of that election, electing convention next Sunday in the forum. Um, because we want everyone to have a sense of what it's like to elect a bishop. Um, so please keep Susan and her husband Tom in your prayers in this time of transition. We don't yet know exactly when she will arrive um, geographically here um, and start work, but the plan is for her to work in tandem with Bishop Catherine, hopefully for a couple of months before the consecration um, as she gets to know us and, uh, and has some extraordinary mentoring from Bishop Catherine. And also please keep in your prayers um, Roy and Michael, the other two candidates who were brave enough to step forward um, for, um, for the election. Another piece of good news this week was our, um, our presentation before City Hall on Monday. Thank you to the dozens of people who came out in support. Um, the City Council voted unanimously to approve our project um, my letter on the back of the Cathedral Life leaflet um, talks about the annual meeting that we had last Sunday too and the various elections and reports and surprises. Um, so you'll find details of many things um, in the Cathedral Life. Um, just um, for, the, for the women, um, the Women Together meeting happens this Thursday. It's dinner and a speaker um, and um, you're asked to sign up for uh, dinner by tomorrow um, so that um, so that the committee knows how many people to, uh, to cater for. 
Thank you again to everyone who came out to City Hall and thank you to our delegates, both lay and clergy, who participated in the Bishop Search process. Um, it's uh, it's a, a gift that you offer to the church. Please stand as you're able. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Saviour and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we, we remember, remember his death, we, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with the blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Paul and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Now, as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who 
table not of the church but of Jesus Christ. It is made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time or ever before, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come not because the church invites you. It is Christ and he invites you to meet him here, the gifts of God for the people of God.
Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. serve the Lord. Thanks.